Ian and Peter Mack Show. Folks, sorry for just a momentary delay. I'm getting my guests connected with me on Skype. I'll be right with you. We're glad you're here. This is the first show of the new year, January 4th, 2012. Let's see if I can get him added here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, sorry for the long delay. This is the Peter Mack Show. It took me a while to get uh, the two other parties connected, but we're there now. So, Stefan, you can hear me, right? I can hear you very well. Okay. Stefan Kinsella is an attorney, actually a patent attorney in the Houston area. He is uh, speaks frequently, writes frequently on the topic of internet of uh, intellectual property rights, our broad topic tonight, and the uh, more focused topic, and that is of the Stop Online Privacy Act, which has to do with greatly limiting the Internet. So, Stefan, I just thought what we would do is have you just talk a bit uh, about uh, – Intellectual property in general, and then and then use that as the uh, the springboard for the discussion of the uh, what's proposed for the internet. Yeah, we're calling it SOPA, and as you and I were talking about um, a while ago, uh, I did discuss this with Stephen Molyneux earlier, and uh, interestingly, you and he both uh, got the acronym wrong, which is not surprising. These things are complex. You, you called it Stop Online Privacy Act, uh, which actually is not a bad. Okay. Description of it. Okay. It's, uh, the official name is the Stop Online Piracy Act. So Stop Online pri- pri- I, okay. Piracy. Okay, I do that, but I I'm too flustered to get yeah. it. Right. Okay, the name is better actually because um, you know this is not the the act doesn't stop piracy. Piracy is when someone on a boat goes up to another boat and shoots and kills people and breaks and steals things. Right. Um, and you know commit acts of real theft and mayhem and murder. Um, whereas uh, the intellectual property advocates and the advocates of copyright in this case um, have started to use the word piracy to refer to people who are basically not really pirates, but people that are copying information and using information and learning and emulating other people, remixing and uh, competing with other people. So um, right off the bat, you can get, get a little bit suspicious about this. Um, but let's back up a little bit. Um, there is a, a law pending in the U.S. called Stop Online Piracy Act, SOPA. Uh, in fact, I read today that, that uh, Spain enacted a, a version similar to it already. So this, this is spreading around the world. What's going on is that we have this mistaken uh, part of our private property system in the West where we protect regular property like houses and uh, land and cars and people's bodies, which are scarce resources, under regular common law principles or under statutes that were based upon those. So theft is illegal, murder is illegal, um, rape is illegal, etc. Well, we have this concept of copyright as well, and people have come to refer to it as intellectual property. It's actually not property. It's not a property right at all. It's just a, a government grant of monopoly privilege to someone, um, which is based upon the government grants of monopoly privilege in the age of mercantilism in England and in Europe. 1600s, 1700s, and around that time, um, and it was used originally in the case of copyright for censorship and to stop the spread of ideas that the church or the state didn't want to be spread, um, and it's morphed into the modern idea, which is used for protectionism and for stopping competition and for thought control, um, because if you have a copyright, you can sue someone to stop them from saying what you don't want them to say, Um so the law is horribly unjust. Statutes, it's a statute law. It's not common law. And it has been sold to the people under the idea that it's a type of property right. So when people started resisting this monopoly right the government was granting to some people because it restricted their freedom of expression and their freedom of press, uh, then the advocates of it started calling it intellectual property so that it sounded like a type of property right. And what's happening is in the digital age, it's getting harder and harder to to stop people from copying information because the Internet is the world's greatest copying machine. And actually, copying is good. Learning is good. Emulation is good. That's what the free market is about. That's what civilization is about. It's about gradually, continually expanding the the body of knowledge and learning from other people and adding to it and changing it up and remixing. So the only way to stop it now is to have increasingly draconian measures that basically threaten to ruin people's lives, put them in jail, kill them, uh, cut them off from the Internet uh, in an increasing attempt to stop them from doing what is natural. It's very similar in this regard to the war against prostitution and the war against drugs, 
where they can't win these wars, but they have to escalate the penalties uh, higher and higher, or greater and greater, to try to stop people from doing what really doesn't hurt anyone else. Okay, let me interject there, if I may, because I think some people who <clears throat> may have not heard you before, Stefan, um, probably have some questions at this point. And, for example, most people know that when somebody writes a book, you know, certainly one that sells or sells well, they it's copyrighted, and that means uh, presumably that no one else can simply uh, photocopy the pages, slap a different cover on it, and sell it without their permission. That, that's right. That's, that's right. right. Okay. Okay. You also can't make derivative works with it, which means make a new creation which is based upon it in a certain way. Right, and everybody, I, I mean, I think even you and I agree that if somebody writes something, in some sense we, we, we wouldn't copy that and say it's ours, while that might not be theft in the sense of stealing, uh, you know, property that is of, uh, you know, limited nature, uh, like a car or, or land and that sort of thing, it still belongs to somebody. So I think it's easy for people to say, well, if somebody wrote a book and it's not proper to um, copy an excerpt even from that book without giving proper attribution to the author, then why isn't copyright appropriate? Why isn't it appropriate to say that person wrote that book and no one else can sell it, um, you know, a copy of that book without that person's permission? Well, so and here's what uh, the advocates of copyright um, are very slippery. They give a, a kind of a, um, a group of defenses of, of copyright, and each one is in, incoherent, really. And when you challenge them on one, they slip to the other. So they go back and forth, for example, between plagiarism and copying. Now, plagiarism and copying are two different things, and what you're really talking about here in part is plagiarism. Plagiarism is just an act of dishonesty. It's an act of misrepresenting um, the person who was an author of an original work of art or authorship. Um, and that has nothing to do with copyright, really, and it's got nothing to do with the law. Uh, that's handled by social norms and customs. Um, right. for, for example, if you take a book that or a work that is out of copyright, like uh, Plato's Republic or Aristotle, one of Aristotle's works, and there is nothing um, in copyright that prohibits you from taking the text of Plato's Republic – and publishing it tomorrow on, on, as an Amazon um, Kindle book and putting your name on it. Right. It's not a copyright violation. Uh, it's not any kind of violation, except it might be defrauding your customer, except what customer is going to buy um, Stephen Kinsella's Republic. When they start right. reading it, they're going to realize I just slapped my name on it, and I'm going to look like an idiot. Right. So this is a very minor problem. It's not really the real problem, and it's self-policing in the culture um, already. So plagiarism has nothing to do with copyright. Um, if I write a book, um, I ha there's nothing stopping me from selling it. I can sell it to people. So the question is, if I put this information out there and I basically reveal this information to other people, can I now complain if they're using it in what they're doing? Um, and the typical copyright case is not an act of plagiarism. It's, it's basically you know, taking the latest John Grisham novel or movie or, or the latest uh, Leonardo DiCaprio movie and copying it. Everything, even the title and the author and the director, you don't actually pretend it's a different author, otherwise you wouldn't sell any. So piracy is copying everything. It's not dishonest at all. It's actually just giving someone an exact copy of what someone else first presented to the market. Right. So the question is, do you violate anyone's rights when you do that? Right. And my belief is that you do not because the only property rights people have is in the physical integrity of scarce resources that they own, including their own bodies. That's how the Lockean homesteading principle works. That's how property rights have always worked. That's the basis of property rights. We wouldn't need property rights if we lived in a world where there was no scarcity, where everyone could have everything they wanted at a whim, and where there was no conflict or violence possible, no fighting over scarce resources were, were possible. Right. So property rights arise to solve that problem, and you allocate owners to different things in accordance with a certain rule. Right. Um, but, so there's just no room for allocating uh, property rights to an idea or a pattern of information. Right. And, and, and I've been swayed by you, you know, in years past by that very argument. But people that are perhaps hearing this the first time would say, well, if uh, John Grisham wrote a book and he's making money off it and somebody else 
photocopies the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel, maybe puts a different cover on there, but same title, same author, and everything, so it's clear that it's John Grisham's work, just, you know, different cover, Mm -hmm. and makes money off it, people will say that's depriving John Grisham of money that he's due for being the author of, of those actual ideas or that actual text. Right, and so the way I would respond to that is, um, well, f- first there's a subtle question begging there, because when you say that the money he's due, it's assuming that he's due it, which means there's a justice aspect to this, and so that sort of presumes your conclusion. But it does, well, the way you worded it, it does put the focus on the right thing. What, what the person who's advocating copyright is saying is that if I uh, co- copy or distribute copies of, whether for free or for, for sale, John Grisham's l- novel – then it's going to be more difficult for John Grisham to sell as many copies or at a high price. So he's going to get less money. So what you're saying is I'm depriving him of money he otherwise would have been entitled to. Right. But whose money was that? That was money from potential customers of his book. Well, he doesn't own their money. They own their money. And if they choose not to give it to him, he doesn't have a claim on that. Um, and I would also say this. We have to decide, you know, if I own a watch and I pass it down, I could pass it down for generations to my great, great, great grandchild. It's, it's in perpetuity or a piece of land um, or a house. So property rights do not expire. So the question we have to ask is if copyright, if the right in an intellectual work is really property, then does it expire at some finite time, which is an arbitrary number like 50 years, 20 years, 70 years, or does it last forever? Now, if it lasts forever, then I think you can see that we would have a stifled culture because, you know, Shakespeare himself built his plays upon already existing ideas that were around in the culture. The entire history of art and creativity is one of remixing. People blend and remix and copy and emulate and improve and recreate, and there's really nothing wrong with this. But if you start giving everyone a monopoly right that lasts forever and ever, then you finally get to a point where we're also ensnared with tangles of, uh, of, of these copyrights that, that have go back for centuries. You could never get enough permission to even act. So we would just – the human race would die off or at least be very bland and boring. Right. Um, so it's just a ridiculous idea, which is why everyone says, no, no, we can't make it perpetual. We have to make it finite. Well, but then is it really a property right? It, and then how do you know what the right length is? Should it be 100 years, 150 years? Right. Nobody knows. They don't have any evidence. Um, so I think this goes to show that there is something wrong with the idea of giving people the right. Uh, you know, there's a famous anarchist, uh, Benjamin Tucker, who said that, you know, if you walk around in public and you spread your ideas out there, you know, it'd be like throwing a bunch of money in a crowd and then complaining that people picked it up. If you want to keep your ideas private, keep them to yourself. But if you want to try to get some kind of benefit out of revealing information you have, whether it's fame or just the pleasure of discussing with people or, or, or trying to make a profit, well, then you're revealing this information to people. You're putting it into their brains, and you can't expect them not to use the information that you've taught them. Right. Well, and I just as a quick aside, and we're due for a commercial here quickly, and then then we'll have the last half to, to you know fully concentrate on the internet a- aspect. But I am writing up proofs to a book uh, that I had in graduate school that was frankly very very hard for me, and I've thought about this concept of uh, copyright, and, and as you pointed out, the easily conflated concept of, or at least I think, easily conflated concept of plagiarism. And if you think about a mathematical proof, and and I know your background is in engineering, so you've been exposed to some of these, um, it's often hard to tell who it's attributed to. Certain proofs are well-known, like there's something called Fermat's Last Theorem. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's well-known. Andrew Wiles proved it in the 1990s and so (laughs) forth. And so that's sort of a known theorem. But people take theorems and prove them, and uh, for example, um, Pythagoras, the Pythagorean theorem has something like 50 known different proofs. So if somebody comes up with a new proof, it's pretty darn hard to say uh, that it's original. It's hard to say if you come up with a proof of anything in mathematics that you didn't in some sense rely on people in the past. Oh, absolutely. No one has, has not relied on anyone. They always rely upon discoveries of others. And, of course, these scientific discoveries and it, uh, occur simultaneously. Now, this really goes more to patents than copyrights because that's more about inventions and scientific knowledge-type discoveries. But, um, I mean, in, in science, um, 
uh, unless you make a property right out of it, you don't really need to have a rigorous definition of who's the, the um, who's the creator of a given theorem or the discoverer. There are scientific norms that govern that, and they don't have to be rigorous because there's not a, a right or a law based upon it. So, for right. example, you had uh, Newton and Leibniz, I think, invented the calculus around right. the same time. And the scientific community uh, right. analyzes what they're doing, and they, they make a decision, and they get recognized historically for their contribution to it. Right, exactly. Well, that's a good stopping note right here. Folks, we have a short break. Uh, I'm told it will be a little shorter because of our... My staff do at the beginning, so bear with us. You're uh, listening to the Peter Mack Show on the Micro Effect. We'll be back here in just a moment with Stefan Kinsella. Would you like to have normal blood pressure? This is Ernesto from Illinois. I had my doctor's appointment yesterday, and I got my labs in. My HDL is 119L, and my LDL is 37L. My doctor asked what I was doing to lower it so much, so I told her about HB Extract. Millions of people, like Ernesto, are suffering from high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, unbalanced cholesterol, irregular heartbeat, and clogged arteries. But now there's an effective, natural, 100% organic nutritional supplement for a healthy heart and circulation. Heart and Body Extract. My blood pressure has not gone past 125 over 80 in almost a month. Experience amazing benefits when your body gets what it needs with the assistance of Heart and Body Extract. did a double take when she looked at my ER labs. She couldn't believe it. Order at HBExtract.com or call 866-295-5305. That's HBExtract.com or call 866-295-5305. Thank you. Heart and Body Extract. Camping, hiking, backpacking, Alice Packs, military surplus, tactical gear. The list goes on and on and on. You can find it at CJL. Enterprise. That's E N T E R P R I Z E dot com. You can call us at 816 359 7945. We are open seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year on the web. Again, it's C J L Enter E N T E R P R I Z E dot com. C J L Enterprise dot com. You can call us at 816-359-7945. CJL Enterprise. This is the Micro Effect. The Micro Effect. www.themicroeffect.com. Welcome back, folks. We're glad you're tuned in here. We're glad you're patient with me tonight anyway. My special guest, Stefan Kinsella, and we're discussing um, intellectual property, and we're about to launch into uh, really the uh, more current uh, crisis, I guess, and what uh, what looms out there for the Internet. So why don't we take it from there, Stefan? Yeah, so um, what you can, you can think of it this way. Until around 1995 when the Internet really started to take off, um, copyright – was more of a sort of printer's guild type thing. It wasn't really that important. And plus the law was changing around the 80s and becoming more draconian. Until the, I believe it was 82, until 1982 with the Berne Convention, uh, which is an international treaty that the U.S. pushed and that we've joined, um, uh, to get a copyright. You had to put a copyright notice on your book or your work, and you had to register it with the copyright office. You had to take an affirmative step to do it, almost like the patent system where you have to register your, your inventions. Uh, now it's automatic. You don't have to put the copyright notice, and you don't have to do anything other than write something down on paper. The second you do that, you have a copyright, uh, and the terms have been extended partly because of lobbying by Disney and others to keep Mickey Mouse alive. So now the term is over 100 years when it started out at 14 years. Okay. By the way, 14 was arbitrary. 14 years was the – was the, was the length of two consecutive seven-year apprentice terms. I mean, that's just what they picked back then. They didn't know what they were doing. They had no idea what they were doing. Um, but it's, it's morphed and metastasized like a cancer. Um, um, and so it's gotten more and more important and embedded into this entire big Hollywood, big media, the R- RIAA, the MPAA, all these lobbying interests, and they depend upon this for their lifeblood. And so – that's one reason people are confused when you say let's abolish it because they're used to the system we have where artists go to these publishers or they go to the um, the big media companies or the movie producing companies and they're they're reliant for their income on that and then they have to crack down on piracy and so it's a whole system 
And, of course, the free market has adapted, or the quasi-free market has adapted to respond to the distortion of the market. Well, when the Internet became popular and we had MP3, movies, digital music, digital information, email, sharing, Napster, then people started copying like crazy. Before that, it wasn't so easy to make perfect copies, analog tape recorders and things like this. So the problem wasn't that widespread. Well, now we have the Internet, and we have the burgeoning online business, and we have the increasing reliance of these media companies on copyright, even on the online world, even though they don't go together. So the online world is all about copying, and copyright is about stopping cop. They cannot survive together. So we're having this clash, and so they're not able to stop piracy. Piracy is rampant. People can do it with encryption. They can use BitTorrent, etc., uh, so there's a lot of piracy going on. And, but, uh, let me just – I'm sorry, that, but that's an unfortunate – as I think you pointed out maybe at the very beginning when I misspoke or, about SOPA, that's an unfortunate use of the word piracy then, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. There's, cop, there's copying going on. What, the, what they right. really mean is there's, there's theft or piracy of the dollars they could have made. But as I uh-huh. mentioned earlier, you don't yeah. own money that you could have made. Um, in fact, that's the nature of the free market if you think about it. Any, anytime you come up with a new business, you want to you – know, a new idea for a new business – you start making a product. Well, if you make a lot of money, you're going to attract competition, and it's not going to be easy to make the same profits for very long. That's the nature of the market. That's the nature of competition, and it's to the benefit of the, of the consumers and the economy and human society in the long term because it induces people to keep improving, keep getting more efficient, keep coming up with new ideas. You have to keep innovating to stay ahead of your competitors. Right. That's what's going on here. It's just a little easier to compete here because you can copy an MP3 file fairly easily. Well, in any case, copyright law is already crazy. We had the um, Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the 90s, which uh, in- ratcheted up the penalties for copyright infringement and applied it to the Internet. Um, they added a safe harbor at the time for online service providers and publishers where as long as you – respond to a takedown notice, then you're not going to be liable for what your users did. Mm. Now, I don't think they realized that that safe harbor was going to be the lifeblood of the Internet. The Internet probably wouldn't have flourished like it has if not for that safe harbor because the DMCA would have killed it. Mm. Uh, And and that's why we have this practice now of these takedown notices because of the DMCA and because the music industry unwittingly agreed to the safe harbor. Um, And thank God they did. Um, We might not have had Google, we've been on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, um, and now what's going on is uh, there's rampant piracy. The copyright law is already being applied in extremely draconian ways. For example, people uh, – under the current copyright law, an average person like you or I or even someone maybe not even as tech-involved as you and I are is theoretically liable for – Billions of dollars a year in damages for infringing copyrights and sending emails to people from sending links from copying articles, um, things like this. So it's already terrible, and the SOPA is poised to be enacted, which would be even worse. It would basically create – turn the internet into a whitelist. You have to be on the government's approved list to have a website, and if you get on their blacklist, then an order will go out from the court or from the government to, like, Google and YouTube and uh, Bing and ISPs, telling them they must remove all the information for this particular offending website that has been accused of having pirated information on it and disappears. It just disappears. So basically it is giving in the name of protecting property rights, which is a travesty to call it that, in the name of protecting so-called property rights – the government is poised to have a tool of censorship over the Internet, which is akin to what is done in China in repressive regimes. This is why there's been an, uh, an uprising on the Internet in the last month or two, which actually stopped this legislation. It probably would have passed about two weeks ago, but now it's been tabled for a few months. And there's boycotts of, of GoDaddy, for example, right now because GoDaddy was in favor of this at first. So the, the, the young community, the digital community, the tech people – um, they are really angry about this. Now, they don't have a solid grounding for opposing it. The real reason to oppose it is copyright is evil. You know, If you believe in copyright, you have to believe in trying to enforce it. That's right. what SOPA is trying to do. Right. But at least they see that there's an excess here. So SOPA is very, very 
very dangerous. It's one of the, the scariest things I've seen in a long time because, in my opinion, the Internet is one of the greatest hopes of mankind for fighting the state. It's a Absolutely. great weapon. Absolutely. We have to keep it unregulated. Uh, it, this, is, this is censorship. This is scary, and we have right. to stop it. And, and certainly – our government even <laughs> should be able to recognize that certain things that have been happening, you know, recently, like the, the so-called uh, uh, Arab Arab Spring, right. would not have happened without the internet. These people find out what's going on in the outside world through the internet, and that's if that's all shut down, and if the if the so-called freest country in the world shuts that down, then that's going to paralyze any other movements that are, you know, in some embryonic stage, isn't it? Oh, it's it's well. Our government is completely dishonest and hypocritical, of course. I mean, Hillary Clinton the other day was, was championing freedom on the Internet, saying it has to be free, and, and, and saying how important it is for the Arab Spring type things. Meanwhile, the very Obama administration that she works for um, has been shutting down websites under the current law with this thing called ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Service. You'll go to some websites that just shut down um, under copyright uh, threats. Um, and uh, there was even a guy the other day, a, a United, an American citizen, sentenced to a year in prison for uploading a copy of the Wolverine movie to a to some some illegal site. So maybe he should have wow. done it. But going to jail for a year? Are you kidding me? In federal prison for uploading a piece of information to the internet? Right. They did this already, and, and so the, it's already horrible. Um, there's a brand new book out by William Patry, a copyright lawyer, called How to Fix Copyright, which has actually, I think, has a lot of problems because he's not really against copyright. He just thinks it's gone too far. But he has a good suggestion in there that, at the very least, we should have a moratorium on any new copyright laws because the current laws are so screwed up and they're not tailored to the digital age. At the very least, we should have no more copyright law at all. We should have. Uh, Obama signed ACTA the other day. He signed it without congressional approval. This is the anti counterfeiting trade agreement. It's an international treaty. He signed on his own authority. Um, and um, you know, as I said, we had to. I thought it. treaties had to be approved by Cong by by the Senate. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, yeah, they do. But he did it under. He called it a uh, uh, an executive agreement. Uh. But it, under international law, it could have the same effect. Right. This is why the Bricker Amendment was proposed in the in the I think in the 40s to try to stop this dangerous use of uh, of signing statements and uh, executive agreements by the executive to get around the Senate's ability to approve treaties because the treaties on the Constitution are the highest law of the land up there with the Constitution. Right. You could theoretically have the president in the stroke of a pen rewrite the Constitution by just calling it an executive agreement. It's very scary stuff what they're doing. Well, well, yeah, I mean, I. The last couple of shows, I've talked about the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012. Yep. That's another very <laughs> scary one. Right. Well, okay, on the copyright then, let's. Uh, we, everybody knows about copying text and emails and sending links and uploading things to YouTube and copying things probably from YouTube. And, of course, people that put things on YouTube want their things to be copied probably. Yes. But what about uh, code? People... Um, People, you know, Microsoft, their entire operating system, uh, Apple system, these are all fairly uh, well-held, tightly held secrets. And people, would it be under under copyright as you see it? Well, there would be no such thing as copyright because people can't, you can't own the information, which is what a, 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 a software program is. It's just instructions for a computer. Well, you know, uh, uh uh, computer software is a, is functional, as you say, and originally it was not covered by copyright because copyright is designed to cover uh, create acts of creative expression, artistic type things. Patent is designed to cover uh, inventions or functional okay. gizmos and gadgets. And so, actually, co software uh, is already covered potentially by patent if because a software is nothing but a process, and there's you can get a process patent. Right. On the way you tell a computer how to do something. Right. Um, so, so basically, software is covered already by, um, by patents, and now it's covered uh, for a couple, two or three decades now. It's covered by software as well because of court decisions saying, well, I think we should include it in 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 copyright because there's an element of our, there's an element of creativity in deciding, right. like, I guess where you're going to put the period in a code. I think <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. It shouldn't be right. covered by. I don't think it should be covered by patents or copyrights. Um, 
Uh, well, right. I was just going to ask. It, it, it has the same the same flaw as does copyright, right? You're claiming that this this instructions uh, <laughs> telling this machine how to operate um, is a piece of property like like land or a car or a, a widget. Yeah. Yeah. Now th- there's a technique that is used. There's some differences in copyright and patent. Patent is better and worse in some ways. It's 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 worse in that you can be accused of infringing a patent even if you independently invented your own technique. So if company A patents uh, a process that their software implements and company B independently comes up with software to do something similar on their own platform, which has a similar flow chart, let's say, they could be accused of patent infringement even if they came up with it on their own. Whereas in copyright, um, you if you come up with it on your own, then uh, you're okay, but you have to be able to prove it. Uh, it's just very unlikely two people are going to come up with the same thing on their own in a copyright con- context. So what they do is they, they have these things called clean rooms, which is not the not the um, the technical clean rooms where the guys in the in the suits like at the Intel commercials, right. but it's basically an approach where you have a Chinese wall type thing, and you can just prove that the uh, you hired some software programmers. They sat in a room with no access to any literature or <laughs> websites, and they just did it cold. So you can prove that they didn't copy it. Which of course is an incre- is, a, is an added burden and an added cost and, and is an inefficiency. Why shouldn't people borrow from each other's good ideas and techniques and continue to improve on them? Right. Okay, so with SOPA, then um, who are the major uh, proponents of the passage of that? And for those of us that understand what you've been talking about on the show tonight, what do we do to keep it from getting passed? Uh, well, I've got a lot of links on my um, my uh, my site. I started a center called Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom with the website, at, which is C4, the number 4, S-I-F dot org. And if you just search for SOPA on there, you'll see lots of links to uh, various um, um, uh, things you can set up a petition or whatever. Like there's a, there's a boycott. I, I would say consider boycotting companies that – call for this, like uh, some of the video game companies, like Electronic, I think ESA or Electronic Arts maybe. Uh, GoDaddy hasn't backed down completely yet. Uh, I mean, they've lost 80,000 domains or something already by people taking them away because they're just so angry that this is a tech company that ought to be savvy to the danger. Uh, The the good guys are are in Huffington at the Huffington Post and um, Sergey Brin and uh, Eric Schmidt at Google and all these tech companies have signed these open letters, and law professors have come out good against this. Civil libertarians have been good about this. All the people that are in favor of civil liberties or that are really into freedom of expression and the use of the Internet and digital technologies are very wary about this. But not necessarily for the same reason, uh, for the depth of the reason, I guess I would say, that you are, right? Well, I mean, I think – I think the reason is the same in the sense that I fear what the government is going to do in the name of copyright protection. They're going to censor and they're going to hurt. And everyone, and most people that are opposing it have that same understanding. Their, their sort of cognitive dissonance is most of them still think we need copyright. So right. they're sort of saying um, – they're left with saying this is going too far. Right. You know, and I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's not too far. If, right. You know, maybe we should have the death penalty for copyright. Right. I mean, if it's really a property for early trespass, then maybe we should just but, but, summarily execute people. Um, right. But if you've pointed out that that notion of going too far is the same arbitrariness as you know, 14 years for a copyright versus 100 years. I mean, where where do you stop? You know. Yes. But at least their instincts are normal. They right. I think they're right. Real I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not damning them. I'm just saying yeah. they're, they're yeah. not. They're not as intellectually pure or as strong as your argument against the whole thing called copyright. Yeah, but I think even the younger generation, a lot of them are starting to see that this copyright idea is, is nonsense. I mean, they, they they don't they know they might get caught and they might have a penalty if they get caught pirating a movie, but I don't think they think it's immoral um, to do things like right. this. You know, yeah. um, so they're starting to see through the the facade of copyright and see that it's used by a bunch of oligopolies to protect their. Um, protect their market. Um, and it's also used literally for censorship sometimes. Uh, there was a case the other day, I've uh, got it on my website, um, where um, uh, this guy, uh, oh, you remember the, uh, I forgot the name of the company, but there was this cell phone company that, that was taking data from your entering your keystrokes. It was kind of a, a controversy. And one guy found out about this, and he published on his blog the manuals 
with, from this company showing the instructions in these cell phone software, and people were concerned it was a privacy issue, and he was doing fair reporting. Um, and he actually, the manuals were on their site. They were in, they were in PDFs on their site, so he wasn't like revealing information they weren't making public themselves. Mm-hmm. Well, their general counsel sent this guy a letter saying, uh, "You got to take this down and apologize, or we're going to sue you into the ground because of copyright infringement." So this company was trying to stop legitimate, you know, journalistic criticism of their practices, which the public has an interest in, on the basis of copyright. Now, this guy had some balls and went to the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He didn't back down, and they made this public what they were doing, and there was a groundswell of Internet activists just piling on this company. And so the CEO, a couple days later, <laughs> retracted the uh, the cease and desist letter, apologized to the guy, pledged to cooperate with the EFF. So it's good that we're aware oh, okay. like this. That's it was great. great. But oh. the point is you can use this for censorship, and it is used for censorship. So – we have to choose. Do you want copyright? Do you want to protect ideas, or do you want to let ideas be free and let people have freedom of expression? You have to choose censorship or free speech. And, you know, Stefan, we've lived all our lives with, with, with copyright of books and so forth, and, and the argument is well known that I put forth that, you know, other people have, obviously, about the, the, the claim that an author would lose potential money yes. and so forth. But we haven't really lived in a society where that hasn't existed, so we don't quite know how that'll play out. And and I think, for example, um, when I, I, you know, I'm a little bit older than you, but when photocopying was first starting to be the rage after like um, uh, the carbon copies and stuff like that, Xerox came out and people used the word Xerox. Right. Oh, Xerox that for me when they meant right. photocopy that. So right. in a way, that was actually. And Xerox, I guess, was the first or one of the first to, to have the machines to do that. So that actually was, I mean, that could be argued that that was actually good for that company, that people sort of made the word Xerox to be, you know, generically mean photocopy. Well, no, that's, that's actually a, another area of intellectual property. That's trademark law. That's, oh, uh, okay. That, that's the issue of uh, if you have a, a mark like Coca-Cola or, or Xerox or Kleenex, Right. And it starts being used generically, we call it, that is, to refer to the entire class, then you might lose your trademark to it, like Kleenex. Right. Kleenex was lost, so you, Kleenex is now used to refer to any type of tissue, not just right. Kleenex brand tissue. Right. So that's why you have these companies trying to say, please don't say Legos, call it Lego brand building blocks, or don't, right. don't call it a Toyota, call it a Toyota brand car, or whatever. Right. Um, you know, so, that, so that's a, a whole different area. There, there's abuses with trademark as well. I, okay, I, but I guess, well, I, that's, that's good that you pointed out. But my, my point was that I, I don't know this, and maybe you do, that that may have actually helped the Xerox company because they were, uh, you've got a plethora of photocopy machines now, but they were the front runner, and maybe there's some, there's some advantage, even though you got 20 competitors to be the first guy on the block doing it. Well, think, think about what a miracle the, or, the or, origin of printing and the printing press was. We had sure. first we had writing, you know, parchment, and then we made it more permanent. You have to chisel things in rocks. Finally, we started having books on some kind of reasonable paper, but you had to have people hand do hand you know scribes and right. control it. And of course, then the church could control all these scribes and and the state. And, and, and control what ideas were being given to the people. Then the printing press came out, and everyone panicked. The church panicked, the guilds panicked, the um, the state panicked, and they started they, they monopolized it. They started the stationer's company to give a monopoly on what books could be printed, so the government could control what books the people would see because they didn't want them to become Protestant or whatever right. at the time. Right. Um, finally, we broke out of that, and we're in the modern age now. And yet, the remnants of this control over what ideas people print. Uh, and the Internet, like I said, is the greatest publication and expression and duplication and learning connection engine and subversive anti-state engine of all time. And copyright just gums up these works and gives the government and opponents of free speech the uh, potential to stop it. Wow. Okay, so your website is c 4 sif or, 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 okay, let me say that again, C4SIF, and uh, as you said, you can go just type in SOPA to a Google engine, and um, many yes, of the and links. An- another great site is TechDirt. TechDirt.com has continual 
uh, horror stories about prop, uh, intellectual property and how it's just uh, harming technology and um, and bus- the business world and the economy and the internet and human freedom. Right. But um, and you mentioned several of these people, uh, you know, well-known CEOs and so forth, the companies that are uh, opposed to SOPA, but. And my concern is, and maybe this is a concern that should be down the road if we delay it at first, is if they don't make a um, solid argument against copyright, and their argument is more of the of the nature of going too far, then my concern is even if SOPA is not passed now, it will reemerge in some other form that will satisfy some of these people, yes, but will yes. just set us up for this same battle 20 or 30 years down the road. So here, so actually SOPA is uh, uh, about three years ago, there was a, a law introduced called COICA, uh, Combating Online Infringement and Counterfeits Act, and that went down to defeat. And then what was called Son of COICA came up, which is um, I think it's called Pro-IP Act the Pro-IP Act, and then that was replaced by TIPA, the Protect IP Act, which is the counterpart to, to SOPA in the House. So these things are sort of um, uh, descendants of, 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 of this legislation trying to survive, and I do think they'll water it down and it might pass, but there's so much opposition to it now. And the one, the one silver lining is that there's a damn good argument, uh, which several law professors have, have put forth, um, that um, – uh, Lawrence Tribe, for example, Lawrence Tribe has a really good argument that SOPA is unconstitutional because it violates the First Amendment. And I think it does because there's no due process. There's no adversarial proceeding. The person whose website is yanked down doesn't even get notified. They don't get to present their case to the court. Um, it's prior restraint. It's a, almost a blatant violation of the First Amendment. So even though the Constitution authorizes copyright in the body of the Constitution, it also has the First Amendment. So those two provisions are in conflict. Um, and it, it seems pretty sure that if they pass anything as extreme as, 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 as they have up there now, it's going to be struck down. Um, whereas if they water it down, it may still be bad, but it may pass muster. I don't know. Right. But hopefully we can drag it out and we can have a lot of uh, attention to this. And if you go to C4SIF and you search for a petition, like SOPA and petition, you'll see a, an online petition you can sign. Um, but we just have to be aware of this, and we have to just fight censorship. Right. By the way, there's an interesting argument, which I've been – Pushing, which I haven't seen anyone else sign on to, but if you think about it, the Constitution was ratified in 1789, and the Bill of Rights was ratified two years later in 1791. So in a sense, the Bill of Rights is, is newer, or came later than the Constitution. Right. And if and to the extent there's a conflict between the First Amendment and the Copyright Clause, and I think there is a conflict because copyright does impede freedom of speech. Well, then you, you would have to say that the newer statute or the newer provision has to prevail, which is the First Amendment. So you have a constitutional argument. There's not really a balance or a tension between these two. In other words, the courts don't have to balance the First Amendment against the, the copyright clause. They can say that it actually repealed it or partially repealed it, right. just like the um, 23rd Amendment repealed or whichever one it was repealed uh, prohibition oh, because it's right. a later amendment. Right. Yeah. Well, that was great, Stefan. I, I'm sorry we got uh, off to a late start there. Uh, but, folks, again, the website C4SIF.org, and you can also uh, Google Stefan Kinsella and uh, learn about other writings of his. Thanks a lot. Uh, we'll have you on again, I'm sure, in the future, and we'll do what we can to fight SOPA. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate it. Very good. Good night. Good night. Folks, see you next week. Bye-bye.